Hello everyone, I'm Mehdi Megas speaking to you from Athens and I'm going to be conducting an interview with dance artist Tanya Erhard. Tanya, thank you for being with us today despite your very tight schedule. <laughs> it's nice to have you with us. So uh, before we begin with the introductions, I'd like to say that this interview is supported, produced and organized by Onassis Stehi as part of the Europe Beyond Access program, which supports disabled artists to, I quote, break the glass ceiling of contemporary theater and dance sectors. The Europe Beyond Access program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and its core partners are the British Council operating in the UK and Poland, Holland Dance Festival, Skonis Dance Theatre from Sweden, Per Art from Serbia, Camp Nagel from Germany, Oriente Occidente from Italy and the Onassis Stehi from Athens, Greece. This interview will be available on the Onassis Foundation YouTube channel for all of you to watch and share. And I'd also like to add that following the interview, an online workshop will take place in which we will discuss issues that will come up in today's interview under the general theme of dance and disability. And we will also have an opportunity to take a closer look at Tanya Earhart's work. Uh, I'd like to express my wish that this interview will contribute to furthering the discussion around inclusivity in the arts in Greece today. So, Tanya Erhardt, would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers, please? Yes. Hi, Medi. <laughs> nice to see you Hello. again. Hello to Athens. Um, so yeah, my name is Tanya Erhardt. I am sitting here right now on a wooden chair in Austria, in Tyrol, in the middle of the Alps, where I grew up. Um, and I am actually wearing today my favorite t-shirt. You actually cannot quite see it, but it's a print of David Bowie. It's a, a shirt I bought in London in a secondhand shop and I love it. It's my power shirt. <laughs> And on top, I am wearing a blue cardigan as well. And I have my long um, brown reddish hair open and hanging over my shoulders. I'm also a white uh, cis uh, female um, and identifying as a disabled crip dance artist and cultural anthropologist. And I want to thank you for having me and doing this interview. And I'm really looking forward to get into dialogue with you and know a bit more about the art scene in Greece as well. Great, it's our pleasure, Tanya. So I'll just follow your lead here. So I, I mentioned I'm in Athens. Um, it's, I don't think it's quite as cold as it is there, but it has turned a bit cooler. I'm in a room with a conveniently black wall that if the need arises, I can write on it with chalk. Uh, I'm 42 years old, white, half Greek, half English. I'm told I look kind of in between. Um, and I'm a dancer and choreographer. I teach dance history, improvisation and choreography. Uh, so, you mentioned Tanya being a cultural anthropologist. Could you tell us a bit about your journey from anthropology to dance, if they, there is a link between the two and how they link for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> because um, for me, my journey went ahead with... Um, yeah, education was very important and my family was always, always very supportive for me to um, do whatever I like to do and then study. And so I was also the first person to in my family to go to university, which was very new for all of us. Um, and I was always interested in different cultures and different medical systems in, in different cultures. Um, also because of my lived experience of being a chronically ill um, and disabled person. And that's my, that was my interest to study 
cultural and social anthropology and then I got really into theory of culture and society and how people make sense of life and the world and being together. And um, while I was studying in Vienna, I actually came in contact with um, another disabled friend um, who has one leg as well. And she introduced me to dance ability. And uh, then I was really excited about dancing with other disabled people and um, improvising and feeling my body in a, in a way that I always loved. I always loved to dance when I was a child and I always wanted to, yeah. <laughs> my auntie to carry me around and dance with me and, and did it by myself. I have two little scars on my, on my chin. I'm just pointing at my chin because because of um, extensive dancing. So I really got into it then in a freelancer or not a freelancer, a, how do you say that in English? Um, when you do it for fun, just because I love to do it. And um, I was then really lucky to find out about the disability studies during my studies. And it was then part of of one section of the whole curriculum. And I really dove into also the anthropology of body and the politics of bodies. And that's then the pathway to my thesis about um, inclusive dance practice and the potential of disability in and through inclusive practice. And then I also did more and more performances. I got in contact with people here in Austria, like um, Vera Rosner, Michael Turinsky, et cetera, who really introduced me into performing and dancing on stage as well. And I, I, I found out how much I love it. <laughs> and so, and I also went to Impulse Dance Festival to educate myself, really, because there was no training. There is no, um, it's, it's hard to get into dance training in Austria as a disabled person. Um, I haven't tried, really, because <laughs> it wasn't even in my atmosphere to, to think about doing it. And so I did, you know, collect bits and bobs from everywhere I could to gain more skills. And um, so people also really supported me then. Actually, they said, Tanya, don't you wanna think of actually going for it? Don't you wanna do that for your life? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, actually, why not? I think I, and, and after I finished my studies in 2012, I thought, okay, if, then I should try now, otherwise I will never do it. And yeah, that's what I did then. So I, I wrote about disability and dance in my thesis, and then I went into practicing it, what I, what I found out about disability as well in the disability studies and the different models of disability. And I got really excited about that actually, because theory helped me so much to understand more about my lived experience, but I didn't have words or I didn't have any tools to talk about it. And my studies helped me to find these. And so, yeah, that's why cultural anthropology first and then so Tanya, at which point did you start identifying as a professional dancer? Was there, um, I don't know, a, a moment when you said, right, uh, from now on, I identify as a professional? Mm. <laughs> Not really. I think it's the term of professional is a really difficult one for me. I, and I think for many people, because um, when I started like leaping into a career of dance in a very um, 
in a, in a sense of yeah, you make money out of out of dancing. I I struggled a lot because I never felt skilled enough. I never felt um, I belong there in this world. I never felt um, I was professional until I actually understood that it's as much about my lived experience of being disabled and the skills I learned through that. Um, and this is what makes me professional in dance. And this is what I'm excited and interested about as well in um, disabled or people who define themselves as disabled dance artists that they bring in an expertise in moving in the world, in being in the world, in, in of life hacks and of relating to mobility devices. So I'm just looking towards my crutches on my left and how to how to use them or how they uh, are moving, for example, me. And so my understanding of profession shifted towards uh, lived experience and the um, capacity of knowledge I collected throughout my life in that. So yeah, I would define myself as a professional in that sense, but I'm not sure if I want to like, um, because being professional is a lot of pressure as well. And is pushing towards a normative understanding of what dance or um, dancing bodies are or can or cannot not do. And I do not identify with this. So, yeah. Um, but I think it is uh, in a very interesting uh, issue to think about whether this is a purely personal decision or one dependent on external conditions. I mean, um, has it got something to do with institutions, how uh, they name things or treat? Um, I don't know. I'm just brainstorming here. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. It's about how I um identify myself and how I am being identified or put into a, a box or a, uh, put on a label. Um, and I think it's, it's always a give and take as well. And I think also those terms or, or words are, they need to keep flexible, they need to shift and also institutions do have a responsibility to rethink those terms over and over again. And I think um, I moved to the UK to, to become a, a dance artist with Kanduko Dance Company, because I think in the UK, it's very much um, driven also from the disability arts and culture scene to um, think what disability is and can be and disability rights, etc. And that has very much um, caught root in society and government and everything. Um, and so it, it's really, it became very clear to me how this is all connected and how institutions as well need to rethink and adjust. And of course, because if they won't, then we all will stay a marginalized, struggling, you know, oppressed minority if we don't work on it, in it together. Mm. Tanya, tell us a bit more about your first experience is um, as a dancer. Uh, I know that you worked for the Kanduko company. Could you tell us a bit more? 
Yes. Um, so I did a apprenticeship with Axis Dance Company. Um, that was immediately after my studies in Vienna. And so I went there for half a year, a bit longer, um, to stay there in California, in Oakland, where they are based. And that was for me the first leap into a dance world as in the sense of, okay, you have a stage, you're, you're, you're like all the, the on stage making pieces, making choreography, dancing, then the behind the stage, like getting ready for performances, like finding the warm up that suits my body and also suits the, the piece that we are performing and the different physicalities, if they're muscular or heavy weighted or, and that, that was like a whole word I, have, I haven't understood before. And that apprenticeship was so important because I talked a bit about pressure before and if I would have been like a, a contract the dancer already, I would, have, I would have felt so much pressure to, you know, um, be a dancer, a professional one, <laughs> which I didn't feel like I was. And so that really gave me the opportunity to find my way into and find new skills and tools to um, adapt into this world. And yeah, the first dances with Kanduka Dance Company was like, oh my, I was so starstruck, first of all. <laughs> when, I, when I met all the dancers, I'm like, oh my God, this is really happening right now. I couldn't believe, I really um, felt like, yeah a dream coming true that I didn't know I was dreaming. But because um, I also, what I really enjoyed with Kanduko, because they are a repertoire company, that means different choreographers are coming in and making pieces with us seven dancers. And I really enjoyed that process because every choreographer was so different in their movement practice or their, their language they use. And so I could, always learn something different about me as well and my movements and my body, body mind um, through different choreographers. And that was a real, that was learning by doing so, so, so much with, with Kanduko Dance Company and... Tanya, you spoke about different processes uh, in order to create a piece. Is there, I mean, now you have started working as a choreographer yourself and uh, you are getting into this world. Um, is there, can you identify a process that suits you better that you feel um, uh, produces the kind of work that you're interested in? Could you talk to us a bit more about process? Yeah, um, what I really enjoy in this process of um, making work with so many um, people that come with different lived experiences is that um, I really want to know who, who the people are and what they bring into space. And because they are, as I said, professionals and experts in in their lived experience knowledge. And so I'm really interested in, okay, what is it that you can bring into the space and what is it that we can bring together? And yeah, as you just mentioned, like I'm just diving into the choreography um, world and what it means and um, to me. And I think I'm really, sorry, Sorry for that little jingle here. Mm. <laughs> I, that's actually something I really enjoy also in making choreography. The, like happy accidents. I, know, I don't know if you know Bob Ross, the painter, he talks always about happy accidents. And I think that is so exciting. And so what I'm really interested in is creating kind of scores or even a structured improvisation where those happy accidents can happen. And for me, that's 
has very much to, to do with interaction, whether it's verbally or, or physically through movement or through the different senses we can use. And um, then going from there and creating something together. That's something I'm really, really interested in rather than um, me transforming something onto someone. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. And what I learned with Kanduko was very much as well to, you know, that going into dialogue with each other. Um, and incorporating that into the process of creation, you mean? Yes. Incorporating the the coming close, really meeting the people, the dancers you have in front of you, and incorporating that into the rehearsal process. Yeah, exactly. It's a very tight collaboration. It's and and not just in the making it on stage but the whole surrounding so for example if we are meeting in the studio to make a piece um, the pathways for people to get to the studio is as important as what happens in the studio then because I also had a lived experience that, you know, public transport is not always the most accessible one. <laughs> and so when I roll in with my wheelchair, um, you know, things can be delayed because of um, it wasn't accessible, there wasn't space for me, da 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 da. And then also when it's weather like this today, it's also very, very cold, as you mentioned before here in Tyrol and wet. And when I wheel in and my wheels are all wet and dirty, I need time and space to clean that before and to prepare myself um, certain ways. And then maybe there's only one accessible wheelchair, accessible toilet. So, and there are several um, people who would like to use it. That all takes time. And this is all that is, um, it needs to be taken into account when working together. And I find that I find that so interesting and to really go for it unapologetically. And that's what um, I did with Katarina Senk, with whom I'm making the piece uh, with right now, is we had a residency in Vienna in May now this year. And it was just no, sorry, not May, in September, of course. Yeah, May was still locked down. In September, but it was still all very fragile and we didn't know how to engage with and to go amongst people again. It was really difficult for me, but we really went for it and we really dig deep into each other's uh, needs and desires and really centered access and care. By definition, I would imagine that um, the relationship between the choreographer and the dancers can be a power. Um, there's a, a play of power there. And so I am trying to envisage, envisage processes which can be empowering for the dancers. Um, I think I, I heard you use that word for uh, one of the Kanduko productions that you were in. I think it was Let's Talk About This by Hetem Patel. All right. And what, what uh, words do you have in mind exactly? Um, I remember you saying that the, the process was for you empowering. Mm -hmm. Yes, empowering. So the word empowering in itself, um, yes, <laughs> that was a very funny piece, I have to say. I really, because just that Tain Patel is just hilarious. I'm Adam, uh, we are Kanduko and we're a contemporary dance company. Nous sommes aussi la compagnie Kanduko. We are a professional contemporary dance rap company. Let's incorporate the 
disabled and non-disabled dance artists. And also we are female and non-female, and gay and non-gay. Standing leg rotates, she folds the whole body on one leg, unravels in a spiral, the crutch like a backwards bazooka. Scanning 250 degrees. And this was, this was like, like a space, space where we could just, you know, talk, talk randomly or really talk neat about neat stuff. And it was just also empowering, especially because we not only talked about uh, taboo topics like disability and sexuality and things like that, but also um, it was very much driven from our own stories, from our own lived experience and how there we could create something that resonates with the audience in a, on a universal level. And Hattain had just such skill to create and carve these stories and also movements that I felt, oh, this is a different way I could let myself be experienced, seen, heard that I did not uh, have before. And I think for me as well in my chore choreographic, um, work now is, is also very much about your own stories that you bring in. And also um, uh, places and spaces or communication that might be tricky and also to, you know, I'm calling out if, if for example, um, a person calls me a handicapped, then, and then I would say, can you please not call me a handicap because it's a word I'm not uh, identifying with and I'm not describing myself with because it's, it's cap in the hand. It comes from the middle age where people and disabled people were begging on the streets. And um, this is something I don't identify with. And so then to create those spaces to talk about this and to talk about, okay, how do you want to be called? What, what do you identify with? Which identities do we carry? And which uh, are we projected on? And that was very powerful in that piece as well. And I, in, my, in my work, I really also want to go there to deconstruct ableist language and how norm, normatized it is in our everyday language. And I want to make people aware of, and just to start, you know, awareness towards ableism and ableist language. And that's very important to me. I want to take this opportunity, Tanya, to steer the conversation over to the activistic aspect of your work. Um, can you talk to us about this? That's a really important question, I think, and a tricky one, I have to say, because not everyone likes to be an activist or, or it's also a question of capacity, I, I realized myself, but in my, in my work, I understood for myself because I am visually very obviously disabled because I have one leg and I use my two crutches or my wheelchair on stage. So this is something people see. And in a performance, in the performance art, the visual is still very uh, dominant. So I was very much aware of from, from the beginning, this is something people come with stereotypes they have about disability, etc. So then the stage also became for me, there was something very empowering that I can let me be seen as, as, as I want it or as we create it. And that was very different to what I experienced in everyday life on the streets where people 
might just, you know, uh, walk by me and then turn around and look at me. And I could like not engage or, you know, also didn't want to engage because I don't, it's not, also not my job to educate people <laughs> in the streets, you know, about disability. It's, it's very, very much a responsibility from society as well. So for me, the stage became what well, was always an activist place um, because I am visibly disabled. And I think it's a different, it's a different discussion when your disability is invisible uh, or not recognizable for certain people. And um, so that's also a question I think people need to define for themselves if they want to be activist or activism. But I always kind of get angry if, if people talk about disability or no, if they do not want to talk about disability and dance, but only the dance and the, the art form. If you, if you have disabled, disabled people involved, especially visual, visually disabled people, because it's always there. You cannot deny it. No question if you want to deny it or not, but it's just there. And I and I and in certain contexts. Um, it then is also very important to talk about it and be very outspoken about it. And in some context, it's not. But I, I fear the danger is in wanting to talk about the art and not the disability is that you do not talk about disability at all. Also not in certain contexts where it's so important to. Yeah, so I do. I am very much an activist. <laughs> I think it's also something I took from my studies to be critical and to understand also critics as an act of care. Uh, what I really enjoy, but that's also part now of my practice is something specific called pleasure activism. It's by Adrian Marie Brown. She wrote the book. I can actually show you. It's this one called Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good. And um, it's a collection also of, of different articles and also her own words. And it's so powerful because she says also there is um, so much, it's so much such hard work to be an activist and to fight for change and liberation and it therefore is for many, many activists really draining and you do have, you know, it, people are, yeah, they're burning out. People are burning, activists are burning out. And she says, we need to find within our work, activist work, the pleasure and how we can actually, there, there is no liberation, no joy, no satisfaction. Um, if we repress pleasure, that's that's what she says, and I so truly believe in that. And um, it's something very powerful when you go really towards what is your individual, what is really your pleasure, in a very very, very wide sense of joy, happiness, um, all that makes you feel good, and to understand that and. I only can say it really helped me throughout the pandemic as well. <laughs> it really did help me. And I mean, you are a dancer, so uh, there's pleasure in dance. So I think the two worlds collide very beautifully. They actually do, yeah. But also I think sometimes in the professional world, it becomes much more about, or very often about, not the pleasure, but conforming or you know adapting although you are so much in pain although you have injuries and although you have um you are burnt out mentally emotionally and i think that's so much ableism going on in the dance performance world that really you should look at 
And that's also what made me clear through the pleasure activism, actually. Mm. Tanya, um, could you explain for our viewers this, this term ableism? I know it's probably a term you're very familiar with, but um, as some of our viewers might not be, could you talk to us a little bit more and maybe give us some examples of um, ableism as a general phenomenon outside dance and then go into specifically um, the ableism concerning dance? I actually would like to read out a quote because um, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> so that's um, Rebel Wheels, New York City, or Michelle Kaplan is, is her name. Um, and her website is whatsableism.tumblr.com. And um, ableism is defined there as a form of discrimination the false idea that disabled people are by default in inferior. And when in truth, disability is just another way for a mind and or body to be. And I think that's so powerful. <laughs> um, ableism is discrimination of disabled people who are um, a minority, the biggest minority in the world and therefore um, it's, it's ableism is trying to put people into a norm that is not achievable anyway, <laughs> if, because we are all different minds and bodies, but especially for um, disabled people and their lived experiences, ableism is so, is something that I experience as very hard to call out as well because it's so often very, very sugar-coated. And it's, it's very, you know, people do or say things out of love, but actually they are very ableist. And, and that starts already in the language, for example. And it's just an awareness that I started to gain of my lived experience of, of ableism and how I have been confronted with it in my everyday life, but also in the dance world. Um, and I did not see that for a long, long time because I didn't realize because of the sugar coating, I thought, okay, people are so nice, but actually no, they are, they're really not. They're just very unre unreflected and ableist in a way that is harmful. And for me, yeah, I realized also in the fight against discrimination against disabled people, we really need to work together. So I realized also um, non-disabled people are, we are in, in the boat together and solidarity and um, the awareness towards it is, the only path we can change things. And shall we talk about ableism in dance? That's a big <laughs> chapter to cover, isn't it? Um, I mean, dance has um, an ableist history behind it, a whole history of um, exclusion. Uh, so how is it to enter an art form that has such a history? Mm. Yeah very harmful, <laughs> very, very harmful. And I had to go through a hard process and working on like understanding what's actually going on because I felt so, um, I needed to be so thankful and so, you know, kind of this, <laughs> bowing towards people taking me in. And so I did everything to adjust into a world that really is not made uh, for so, so many people. <laughs> but then as well, um, I experienced, for example, ableism also the towards the behavior, um, towards my um, assistive devices towards my crutches or, or my wheelchair. 
um, and that in, in various forms. So for example, when we go travel, when we go on tour, um, flight attendants not necessarily be very careful with those things. And that all, you know, it all affects being in the dance world. It's all part of the package. But then as well, people calling me a wheelchair or a crutch, for example, like, <laughs> so the wheelchair is traveling from the upstage diagonal towards the downstage. And I'm like, okay, so I just leave my wheelchair there and I go for a cup of coffee meanwhile, thank you very much. And it's just awareness, you know, in, in the heat of discussion of things happen, I know that. But we really need to make people aware of it and to then really work on changing it. And that's the process of calling out ableism, which can be really hard and full on. And if it's only doing just one person, I realized whew, there's only so much capacity one has. Anya, is what you're talking about now um, crip time. I've heard you using that term in the past and it sounds yeah. very controversial to me, but um, yeah. would you like to talk to us a bit about that term? I would actually ask you, what do you think uh, the controversy is in, in crip time? Well, if I'm not mistaken, it comes from the word cripple and um, I'm not sure that would be a word um, I would ever use to describe. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm sure it would be a word I would never use to describe um, a disabled person. Um, but I have um, read in Anne Lee Cooper's, um, do you know that text, uh, Choreographing Difference? She speaks about disabled artists identifying as cripples. So I know that it's not something new, but um, maybe you'd like to share something more with our viewers. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the term cripple, actually. It's, I think, somewhere... I'm, I'm just looking at the wall behind me where I have loads of colorful post-its where I wrote down the ideas and... <laughs> things I want to talk about during the interview. So yeah, it's definitely somewhere in there because Crip is, um, yeah, you're right. It comes from the term cripple, but cripple has been used as something that people call us, that people call disabled people, um, they are cripples. And Crip is now trying to do the opposite to um, take that term crip and uh, describe it by ourselves again and what it means to us to be a crip. So crip is actually a noun, but as well as a verb. And it's, it's very much, um, I've been in a, in a symposium where we have been talking a lot about CRIP and Dina Müllermann was doing a, a workshop where she really asked us to, what does the word, how does it smell? How does it taste? How does it sound? Um, what's the texture of it? And I think that's what CRIP is trying to do is to um, give your color to it and what it means to you as the lived experience of being disabled and how time works for me, how, how rest is important in my life, how, you know, having crutches allow me to walk in a vertical position through space, through the world, but also I like to crawl on the floor, you know, that's, that's also me being crippled. And it's, it's very frank and very, very, for me, it's, it's a term I really enjoy using for defining a world for me through my lived experience. You have talked about feeling as though you have three different bodies 
in dance. <laughs> Is this connected yeah. to what you were just saying? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I like to <laughs> call myself a dancer with three different bodies. So people actually should pay me three times salary, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but what I mean by that is because I use my my crutches so I have two uh, black crutches I'm just showing you one now her name is Frida and this is Freda <laughs> yeah. and um, I have a, a different physicality or a different way of being and moving with my crutches um, than I have with my wheelchair or with our any assistive tools. And these are all different body minds I engage with. In, and I think especially in dance, they bring so many different um, movement, qualities, movement, um, rhythms, efforts, et cetera, et cetera. And um, for me, it's all of, of all part of being crip. But and and I just find it incredible, you know, to really engage in these body minds and what they bring into space. Tanya, I'm curious, does the word crip translate into Austrian? No, that's a really good question. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> Because actually, in my in our new piece called Jenga with Katharina Senk, we are um, talking in English and German because for us access is very important, and so we also want to have um, wanted bilingual, but also with sign language. And we constantly confront these discussions, like, okay, how do we say that in German? And actually, there isn't. So Tanya, I was hoping to get into some more specifics around the special challenges that await a disabled artist who chooses to embark on a career as a choreographer. Um, for example, when you go on tour, um, are there certain things that someone needs to consider? Um, would you like to talk to us about that? Yes, 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 yes. A very important part. Also, um, what I started to do actually is something also I learned from uh, Mark Brew from Access Dance Com Company is that he calls an access rider. And an access and care rider, I call it, it's something that I started to develop and it's a, it's a um, file. It's a, it's a PDF file or something that where I list um, my access and care needs. And that can, of course, be for going on tour, like what um, hotel room access do you need? Does it need to be wheelchair accessible? Do you want the bathtub? Um, do you want showers only? Do you have any food allergies, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, then it can also have, in general, the travel information about, um, for example, when I travel with my wheelchair, I do not want to leave her out of sight. So I want to have a seat where I can have my wheelchair with me. So I started to rather than always put it separate in an email, I started to make a file and then adjust it to every project and the needs of the project and then send this file. And it just saved me time. <laughs> Our co-producer, we also talk about, you know, how do we want to address the press and what words we, we like, we use, how we identify and which words we specifically do not want them to use 
because of stereotypes around them. And sometimes it's just easier really to avoid <laughs> certain um, words rather than having a deep conversation about it. So I did, but this is all conversations we have with the institution. And also we were discussing how much access is also starting on their website to buy the tickets and to give access needs information from an audience member's perspective um, and how it's their responsibility how what is their responsibility to think through and look at when i started to really center these questions it's just like you know da -da 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 opening up and it's really complex and i love i love that complexity complexity because that's life you, you mentioned your collaborator, Katharina Senk. Could you, would you like to speak to us about the previous project and the project you're doing now? Um, because these are co-choreographed, right? By, the both, by both of you? Yes, it's a collaboration, a tight collaboration we do. Yeah, so it started in 2018. Well, we met in 2017 and in 20, 2018, we got a residency in the UK and we worked for five days in the studio because I invited her. Um, so the idea was that I could just have space to do whatever I want and to figure out what I'm interested in as an artist and becoming an I just left a Kanduko dance company and wasn't sure of what I'm going to do now or what, what is it that I really want to go for. And so in that space, I was curious of really looking at my disabilities. And I mean, one way is to look at the, or was for me to look at my assistive devices. And I chose my crutches. So I chose my crutches to work with my crutches. and. I was really interested in how they actually move me rather than how I can move them. And it, it makes a real difference. I just saw your brain <laughs> working there as well. And it took me a long while to really articulate the, and understand the difference because to understand how a crutch moves me, I really need to engage with this material with you know the weight the metal the sensation on the body the what is it actually then also more abstract made for it's like a supportive device that helps me to walk upright so it's 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 made within a capitalist system you know to be also productive and to reflect all these things off of a crutch you know and that was, I get really into that also as a cultural anthropologist, of course. And then I thought at some point I would get really lost. And so I was talking to Katharina because she has worked lots with objects herself in different choreographic processes. And I was interested in her approach to it. And um, I thought that's now the time to actually figure that out. And so we came together and she came to the UK because she lives in, in Vienna and I live in London and based in London. And she introduced um, then as well, if we actually would like to make a Skype <laughs> performance or a Skype thing out of it because um, we didn't have time, the time or money to travel all the time in between those two cities. And so we, yeah, did um, create kind of a Skype performance where we connected each other from two different countries or cities or whatever. And then we get really into also engaging different audiences with each other and, and creating moments of the happy accidents that I talked before and where they actually also could talk with each other or they could hear each other talk or engage um, with us. And so with Katharina, then it really, yeah, also became like a very, first a very 
physical uh, research, what it is to work with a crutch, because I borrowed, I gave her one of one crutch of mine, and I kept one to to research and explore. And then all this question of okay, so who do does Catherine actually ask, need to ask for permission to work with the crutch because she doesn't identify as disabled and being aware that there is a lot of there is disability appropriation out there where people take our um, assistive devices or medical aids to you know create art but actually not have anyone <laughs> in the piece to who has the lived experience or to support the community at all and we laugh so much <laughs> it's like belly laughter and she has we both have a very loud laughter and so nearly the walls are <laughs> trembling when we laugh and it's and just this is um also makes it opening up the space to talk about ableism and all these difficult things that can be difficult to talk about so that was how the cross-border balance game came across yeah <laughs> came came about sorry yeah 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 you're right the cross-border balancing game oh hi katarina <laughs> Hello, Talia. Hello. Hi. Are you ready to play the game? I am ready to play the game. Always ready to play the game. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> Three, two, two, one, one. Go. Oh. The non yielding, the first thing we were working on, it never really got to a funded performance. Um, we were just sometimes invited to uh, present the sharing and it worked really well and then we said oh, we actually really should make something out of it that we have in the repertoire and can tour and work with and so we applied for funding in Austria and we, we got the funds and now we're working on the piece called Jenga and hopefully it's gonna be premiered end of January in Vienna. So now working um, from the position of a choreographer, are you uh, more conscious of the idea of the aesthetics of access? Um, would you like to talk to us a little bit about that? Um, how you define this idea and how it changes the way um, a choreographer thinks about his work and about his creative process? Yeah, so the aesthetics of access is something I came across in another um, collaboration or like research project that was involved in Germany and um, is actually happening in the UK for a few years now. And the idea is that access is centered in the making process. So it's not only been added after the piece has been made and crafted already, and then maybe put an audio describer next to it um, to the, or a sign language interpreter to um, sign happening. But it's really part of the whole making process to make, it, um, to make it a space where people can experience the, the piece in, in different ways. And um, I get really interested in it as well, actually through the practice with the crutches because um, 
I was interested in how my crutch sounds actually. You know, what, what sound does it, make, does it make? And I played once around with my, and attached my phone to the crutch and filmed it. And I could hear suddenly the squeak of the, cause I have, a, how do you call that? Um, it's, it's something that you have that in cars. I just can't find the, the word now. It's something that um, it has a little spring. The suspension. Yeah, that one, thank you very much. <laughs> the suspension that actually takes pressure off my shoulders when I walk with it. But suddenly it became uh, audible. I could hear a squeak or I could hear the mechanics of it. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And that's really exciting because it brings another level also into, into a performance and experience. And then Karen and I were talking about it and we were then really interested in a multi-sensory approach of within a, within a performance setting. And that is one way for us to um, make an aesthetics out of, of the access and to engage with, you know, the air, different senses like sound, um, taste, touch, smell, etc. And I think it is very, very tailored also to every um, project or every every need. Like there is not one aesthetic, there is not one practice. And that's also the beauty of it, of, of how you can make it work so people can have different access also in, to, your, to your piece and into the integrity of your piece, yeah. Tanya, would you like to take a minute and have a look at your post-its? Maybe there's something there that we haven't touched upon that you, you would really like to talk Ooh, about. Shall I really? <laughs> there might be something indeed. Um, so I'm just scanning through my post-its, trying to read. Um, actually... Um, yeah, something that actually is very much connected to what we have just been talking about is um, uh, the hashtag access is love. Can you see that? Yes. And it's a, a project created by Mia Mingus, Alice Wong and Sandy Ho. And they are brilliant artists and people who identify as crip as well. And they, um, uh, with that project, hashtag access is love, they are really calling to center access as an act of love. Mm -hmm. And and not something that, oh, it takes more time or more money or blah, 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 but actually as an act of love and what that means. And also I will keep you, updated via social media that's also something i would very much recommend social media helped me a lot in you know understanding lived experience and people's um, work and crip people's artists work so you can find me on instagram you can find me on a website called tanya erh.art but this is very outdated i have to say i will update <laughs> when I find time. <laughs> so, yeah, I just also wanted to thank you, Maddie. It was a pleasure talking to you. I, I really enjoy your, your thoughts. And um, like, I like when people make me think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and engage in conversation. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And I think um, it will be a very interesting interview for um, many people to watch here in Greece. Uh, I think it's very, very important to open this, these issues up and talk about them, discuss them. And then 
um, you know, go into the field of dance and see how all of these ideas apply to the art of dance. So um, we will uh, see you again during the workshop, I hope, even if it's for a little a short amount of time. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. Thank you for your great work. <laughs> we'll speak again soon, Tanya, I hope. Yes. Bye-bye. Ciao. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Bye. Ciao. <laughs>